Having tricked the Africans, the king now set about convincing the European powers that he should be allowed to own this vast African colony. This time, it wasn't magic, it was diplomacy. By 1884, the great powers were all lined up in Berlin to hand over the Congo to the king. No Africans were invited. Ce document, c'est l'acte général de la conférence du Congo, publié le 26 février 1885 à Berlin. Ce document est connu dans l'histoire comme étant l'acte général de la conférence de Berlin. Léopold II, roi de Belge, n'était pas présent à Berlin. The conference gave Leopold everything he wanted. It's very remarkable to see that King Leopold managed to trick the great powers at that time. He promised that everybody would have access to that, that it would be free trade, that if there was anything to be gained, that everybody could participate in the loot. And there was quite some remorse afterwards in other countries that he got away with it, but he did. Le Congo est à peine reconnu par les grandes puissances comme propriété personnelle de Léopold II que le roi met en branle sa machine infernale. Dès le 1er juillet 1885, un décret stipule que toutes les terres vacantes, des terres vacantes, sont propriété de l'État. En 1991 et en 1992, d'autres décrets vont déclarer les produits de la forêt appartenant exclusivement à l'État. Et les indigènes ne peuvent pas les exploiter, sauf pour l'État. Donc, euh, en un tour de main, Léopold II a dépouillé les Africains de tous leurs biens et transformé le Congo en un vaste camp de travail forcé. To enforce his rule, the sovereign king had created an army. In time, it would be 16,000 strong, equipped with modern Belgian-made automatic rifles. The novelist Joseph Conrad was in the Congo Free State from the start. As a result of what he saw there, he wrote Heart of Darkness. They grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence aggravated murder on a great scale, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. Fear, like forced labor, was an integral part of the king's plans to make the Congo profitable. To administer his new territory, Leopold appointed executives in Brussels and a governor general in the Congo. But in fact, he ran it himself. His agents, his soldiers, carried out his wishes. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. Despite Leopold's armed soldiers and his labor camp methods, the Congo was not paying its way, and it was crippling Leopold's finances. As the months went by, the king was getting increasingly desperate. What saved Leopold was the demand for cars and bicycles. When John Dunlop, an obscure Scottish vet, invented the first pneumatic tower, suddenly there was a huge market for rubber. And the Congo had rubber. In 
in the years to come, there will be competition from rubber plantations in Asia and South America, but for now, the king had the market all to himself. The more rubber he could get to Europe before the new plantations came on stream, the greater the killing. Leopold combined the mind of a businessman and entrepreneur on one side and the mind of a political megalomaniac on the other side, and the two are very much linked together. Certainly, in that time, the second half of the 19th century, there's a clear link between economic power and political power. If you wanted to mean something, you had to have a lot of money, and that was what he intended to do with the Congo. For Leopold, transforming his new assets into cash simply meant ratcheting up the level of force. Villages in the rubber areas were set heavy targets and punished violently for refusal or failure to deliver. The reign of terror had begun. Dix avril 1895. Six indigènes tués. Village livré aux flammes. Déjeuner puis retour. 17 avril 1895. Parti avec 80 hommes pour Bauru. Une quinzaine de personnes tuées. 25 avril. Arrivé à Iteke. Brûler le village ainsi que Yambi. Ilongo. Brûler le village et tuer un indigène. Arrivé à Bakolo à 16 h Brûlé. Arrivé à Yabumba à 11h40, je fais brûler le village. Arrivé à Likombe à 3h, tout à coup nous sommes attaqués. Deux soldats sont tués à côté de moi. Après quelques instants d'une fusillade bien nourrie, les indigènes prennent la fuite en laissant 13 des leurs sur le terrain. Je fais mettre le feu aux cases. Oui, juin. Je me dirige ensuite sur Yamapete. Je fais incendier le village. Après un bon déjeuner, nous rentrons en triomphe à Bazoko avec nos sanglants trophées. 10 juin, nous trouvons Yambisi. Nous envoyons plusieurs groupes de soldats battre la plaine. Ils reviennent quelques heures après avec 11 têtes et 9 prisonniers. Le 22 juin, on nous amène trois prisonniers dans la matinée. Trois autres vers le soir et trois têtes sont apportées. Un homme de Bomané, parcourant la forêt en appelant un grand cri sa femme et son enfant égaré, reçoit une balle d'une de nos sentinelles. On nous apporte sa tête. Jamais j'ai vu une telle expression de désespoir, d'effarement. Nous faisons incendier Yambisi. Ik denk dat inderdaad Leopold II de morele verantwoordelijkheid draagt voor wat binnen het systeem waar hij achter stond en dat hij heeft georganiseerd, ja, dat hij daar de morele verantwoordelijkheid voor draagt. Natuurlijk, dat is, dat is duidelijk. King Leopold certainly did not deliberately go into sort of murder or whatever. King Leopold was part of, of a regime and part of an economic sort of system that basically considered that part of the work as his private property and that he could rule as he wished. And King Leopold also, he was a man of vision. You can strongly disagree with his vision, but he did have a vision. And Congo, of course, whether you want it or not, but has meant a lot to the Belgian economy. So. For Belgium, there have been huge benefits to the involvement in Central Africa. 